Good morning again, folks. Uh, don't worry, after Ambassador Kay now's <laughs> remarks, we'll remove the uh, podium so you'll have a, a better chance to see us during the Q&A. <clears throat> again, welcome everyone to CSIS on this rainy but somewhat warm day. Uh, before going any further, let me point out the emergency exits to you. Of course, the main stairs that some of you may have come up, then there's a set of stairs behind the elevators, and then out the back there, there's a third set of stairs. So in the event of an emergency, you do have three options there. My name is Tom Sanderson. I direct the Transnational Threats Project here at CSIS. We pursue independent research on terrorism and counterterrorism, both at home and abroad, with the purpose of helping to enhance the perspectives of our policymakers, counterterrorism practitioners, and many others as they lead the effort to protect us from terrorist groups and many others, including ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, and a range of other groups. We have conducted fieldwork in over 70 countries where we interview everyone from terrorists to host nation security services to clergy and journalists and many beyond there. One of our nation's leading officials with responsibility for protecting our nation from these threats is Ambassador Tina Kadenow, the U.S. State Department's counterterrorism coordinator. Ambassador Kadenow is no stranger to public service. Indeed, her work has taken her to a number of interesting and not occasionally dangerous places. Prior to serving as counterterrorism coordinator, she was deputy ambassador at U.S. Embassy Kabul, certainly one of the most challenging jobs you could have in foreign service. She also served in senior positions in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, was the first U.S. ambassador to Kosovo, and served on the U.S. National Security Council. Suffice to say, Ambassador Kay now brings exceptional experience to bear in the role she is now serving. That role as ambassador at large and coordinator for counterterrorism is to forge partnerships with other governments, many of whom are represented here today, non-state actors, multilateral organizations, and others to advance U.S. national security and counterterrorism objectives. And with that, let's give a warm welcome to Ambassador Tina Cade now. All right, well, as you can see, I'm height challenged and therefore I need to bring this down a bit. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what it says to sort of be introduced with a very, very nice uh, lengthy introduction, but also with the, you know, how to head for the exits kind of uh, intro. But um, I hope it won't come to that. And I want to specifically say thanks to everybody for, um, for showing up uh, what amounts to about a week, I guess, after our Snowzilla uh, <laughs> delay. So really, thank you all for coming. I think it's a... Uh, it's an important moment. Um, I, I always say that at the outset of the discussions that I have. Um, and unfortunately, it only gets more important, I guess, in the Chinese curse sense as we go along here, uh, because really these issues are incredibly salient, and they're only becoming more so over time. And I think we all know that. And that's why the, the turnout, and that's why I'm particularly grateful to all of you for taking the time. I know you're all busy. Um, and let me thank CSIS and Tom particularly for organizing this today. Uh, I think. It's really important to me, um, the role that CSIS and other NGOs play. It really provides a, a very critical venue for us to share our ideas on national security. Um, and I hope to keep this kind of conversation going, not just here, uh, but in, in other venues as well, because I think it's really, really important to hear outside stakeholders. It's important that you not sort of feed on your own thoughts uh, incessantly, but, but make sure that you are um, getting that input from, from other sources as well. Um, I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity to focus on our civilian counterterrorism efforts, uh, especially to counter ISIL. Um, although I want to emphasize when we're talking today about ISIL, this is really important to me, that we have not taken our eye off the other important threats that still exist out there, uh, including those posed by the remnants of al-Qaeda and by Iran affiliates and proxies, including Hezbollah. Um, and we can certainly discuss all of that as well in a lot greater detail if people are interested. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to address some of that. Um, but today I think conversation, and not surprisingly so, will uh, indeed hinge mostly on ISIL and its manifestations both in the Iraq and Syria theaters, but also globally. Over the last two years, the international terrorist threat picture has been in some ways transformed um, by ISIL's territorial expansion by the promulgation of its so-called caliphate, and by its campaign, uh, which it specifically speaks of as aimed at the West. Weak or failed governance, in many instances, has allowed ISIL to take territory in Syria and Iraq, certainly, 
and continues to provide an enabling environment for ISIL and its affiliates, notably in the Sinai, in Libya, and in Yemen, among other places. ISIL's seizure of territory in Iraq and Syria, its continued access to significant numbers of foreign terrorist fighters, its increased number of global branches, its unprecedented use of social media to spread its message to radicalize and recruit individuals to violence, and its external plotting, have all of those things have elevated it to one of our most pressing, if not the most pressing, counterterrorism priority at this moment, and that's why it, it continues to dominate the conversation. Through its propaganda and its adherence on the ground in the Iraq and Syria battle space, ISIL has also been able to, unfortunately, inspire or direct, in some cases, attacks by individuals or small groups of individuals in several cities around the world, as we have, to our great regret, seen in Paris, in San Bernardino, and most recently even in Jakarta, in Indonesia. ISIL aligned groups have established branches across the Middle East, in North Africa, in West Africa, in the Russian North Caucasus, and in South Asia, among other places. The relationship between these affiliates and, if you might call it, core ISIL, like we used to call it core al-Qaeda, in Iraq and Syria, um, beyond ideological affinity and inspiration, is indeed the subject of much discussion. Most of these branches are made up of pre-existing terrorist networks, so things that we had seen in some manifestation even before, many of which had and continue to have their own local goals. We're watching very closely to see whether the extent of their interaction with core ISIL, again, if you want to call it that, might lead these branches to broaden those goals and then gain access in any way to increased financing or to weaponry or to other things that concern us. President Obama has made it extraordinarily clear that defeating ISIL is indeed a priority for us. And as he indicated in his State of the Union remarks on January 12th, priority number one is protecting the American people and going after terrorist networks. We're addressing this challenge head on and thankfully, we are not doing this alone. For more than a year, America has led a coalition of 66 partners, welcoming our newest, indeed, coalition partner, Afghanistan, just this past week, um, dedicated to degrading and defeating ISIL, including by cutting off ISIL's financing, disrupting their plots, and stopping the flow of foreign terrorist fighters. With nearly 10,000 airstrikes, we are methodically taking the ISIL leadership off the battlefield, as well as going after their heavy weapons, their oil tankers, training camps, bulk cash storage, we can talk a little bit about financing too, and their infrastructure. Working with local forces on the ground, we've taken back roughly 20 to 25 percent of the populated territory that ISIL once held in Iraq and Syria. And in Iraq alone, ISIL has lost perhaps 40% of what it held at its peak in August 2014. Now, I don't want to overstate that, but I do want to point to it because I think it's important and I think that sometimes it gets overlooked. Since the attacks in Paris, our closest allies, including France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, have ramped up their contributions to the military campaign, which is helping us accelerate our effort to defeat ISIL. Similarly, the Iraqi military has displayed tremendous perseverance and courage in fighting to dislodge ISIL and return the capital of Anbar province back to the Iraqi people. Kurdish forces in Iraq have also driven ISIL from Sinjar. Syrian Arab and Kurdish forces have pushed ISIL from key parts of northeastern Syria. These coalition advances will make it harder for ISIL forces to find safe haven, to regroup, and to plan external attacks. They will not stop them right away, but they will degrade ISIL's abilities over time, which is what we are aiming to do. Efforts will continue in the military realm with vigor and a continued amount of focus and attention, as I've described them. But I do want to say, and again, I, I frame this at the top of my remarks, I think it's very, very clear that we cannot address counterterrorism, even in the context of ISIL, solely through military means. We need to keep denying ISIL the supply of foreign terrorist fighters, 
cut off their access to finance, disrupt and expose their messaging, and stabilize the vulnerable communities that have been liberated from ISIL control already. That's an important piece that we can talk about again a little bit more, but that, that part is absolutely critical. I'd like specifically to drill down a bit more in the area of foreign terrorist fighters. We continue to face an unprecedented flow of foreign terrorist fighters, sometimes uh, known by, it has to have an acronym, FTFs, to Syria and to Iraq, which has necessitated an integrated, comprehensive, and global response. Using the framework of UN Security Council Resolution 2178, a landmark resolu resolution that was passed in September of 2014 under U.S. leadership, we're working with partners to put in place the fundamental reforms that will stem the long-term flow of FTFs, or foreign terrorist fighters. Implementation of this UNSCR involves wide-ranging efforts to increase information sharing among countries, implement counterterrorism legislation, strengthen border security, and increase efforts on counter-messaging and countering violent extremism, also known by its acronym of CVE. While there's still a great deal of work to do, we are beginning to see some tangible results. The United States now has information sharing agreements or arrangements with over 49 international partners to assist our efforts to identify, track, and deter the travel of suspected terrorists. Approximately 45 countries have passed or updated existing laws to more effectively identify and prosecute foreign terrorist fighters. 35 countries, as we, we count them, have reported arresting FTFs, and 12 have successfully prosecuted at least one foreign terrorist fighter. Turkey, a, cri a particularly critical geographic choke point in the flow of FTFs, has increased detentions, arrests, and prosecution of suspected FTFs, has increased its information sharing with international partners, including with the United States, and is taking steps to improve, it, to improve the security of its border. We're working with the entire array of our partners, not just Turkey, including notably in Europe, to further increase security at their borders and eliminate existing security vulnerabilities, enabling them to better identify restrict, and report the travel of suspected foreign terrorist fighters. That means in particular sharing passenger name records provided by the airlines and so-called advanced passenger information, API, for those of you who are familiar with that terminology. It also means taking greater advantage of Interpol's resources and screening passengers against Interpol's foreign terrorist fighter database and its stolen and lost travel document system. As a result, we've already seen a significant increase in coordination among partners in adding suspects to terrorist watch lists and sharing that information more broadly. And again, we can talk about this in greater detail. Security will never be the be-all and end-all of everything that we do with respect to foreign terrorist fighters, but if you know that these people are moving across borders, then clearly border security, adding to that security, compounding that security, is really a critical part of what we have to do. And that's why all these measures that I'm discussing really, really matter, uh, and why we have taken so much care and so much time in trying to work these arrangements with other countries. In the aftermath of the recent attacks in Europe and elsewhere, we have further accelerated efforts to address the FTF threat. As the White House announced on November 30th, the United States is prepared to deploy teams of technical experts in order to help work with countries to counter terrorist travel even further. So-called foreign terrorist fighter surge teams, uh, as we envision them, meaning teams of US experts, can offer specific technical assistance to enhance partner capacity in various areas, including, as I said, information sharing, risk-based enhanced traveler screening, border and security management, utilizing financial intelligence, and law enforcement investigations. We're also working hard to counter the ISIL narrative. There's no question that we need to do more to counter ISIL's propaganda and its online radicalization and its recruitment efforts. We recognize that the most effective messengers are our partners in majority Muslim countries, and we also understand, very frankly, 
that governments are not usually the very best agents for delivering this kind of content or for pushing back on the messaging that ISIL utilizes. We know that groups and individuals are inspired by a whole range of personal, religious, political, or other ideological beliefs to promote uh, and to use violence. But as the terrorist threat posed by ISIL continues to grow, these partnerships and support for Muslim community elements at home and abroad are really becoming more critical than ever before, which is why the State Department just last month announced the launch of what we're calling the Global Engagement Center to integrate and synchronize our communications against violent extremist groups, including both ISIL and Al Qaeda. The new center, the so-called Global Engagement Center, will shift our focus from countering violent extremist messaging away from direct messaging um, and towards a more important and we think growing emphasis on empowering and enabling our partners, both governmental but more importantly perhaps non-governmental across the globe. The Global Engagement Center is just one piece of a larger CVE architecture that the State Department is now developing to enhance our overseas CVE efforts and our respective partnerships. We continue to pursue a range of efforts to build resilient communities, to enhance relationships between communities and the security sector in various different countries, and to build a whole of society global approach to address the drivers of violent extremism, both in the context of addressing ISIL and other existing terrorist threats, but also preventing any new ones from emerging, which is a longer term prospect, but also important in its own way. The UN must also play a critical role in CVE efforts. UN Security Council Resolution 2178 that I mentioned earlier calls on member states to enhance efforts to counter violent extremism. It identifies preventing radicalization, recruitment, and mobilization of individuals into terrorist groups and becoming foreign terrorist fighters as essential elements of addressing the threat that they pose to international peace and security. As a sign of the importance that the UN places on CVE, the Secretary General unveiled earlier this month a plan of action for preventing violent extremism. The plan calls on member states, UN member states, to develop national plans of action to prevent and counter violent extremism. And we look forward to actively supporting this effort together with a variety of key international stakeholders and the Secretary General. While we need to counter the aspects of ISIL's network that are truly global, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact, obviously, that the manifestations of ISIL support that we are seeing in different regions outside of Iraq and Syria are driven by specific political, economic, and social dynamics that are unique to those regions. The situation in North Africa is significantly different than that in South Asia, to state the obvious. Our approach and our CT partnerships, therefore, have to be tailored to the specific region, to the country, and even to the very community in which we are operating. And that makes this particularly challenging. Um, I think that's the growing challenge and the thing that we must cope with and grapple with as we move forward on the CT front over the next months and years. As I indicated at the very outset of this discussion, it's also important to note that while the AQ central leadership, the Al Qaeda central leadership, has been significantly weakened, the organization remains a threat and continues to serve as a focal point of inspiration for a network of affiliated groups, including Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP so called, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, the Al Nusra Front, and Al Shabaab. Notably, AQAP, which has made several attempts to attack the United States since 2009 and maintains the capability to try again, remains a significant threat to Yemen, the region, and to the United States. We're also seeing Al Qaeda and ISIL competing with each other. In what could very well have been an attempt to upstage ISIL's role in the Paris attacks, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb attacked a hotel in Bamako, Mali, that same month. Last week, over two dozen civilians were killed in an attack in a hotel in Burkina Faso. This should remind us that terrorists are adaptable by nature and that our counterterrorism efforts must match their adaptability, and that is, of course, uh, quite the challenge. 
ISIL and AQ are not the only serious threats that confront the United States and its allies. We remain vigilant against Iran's support for terrorist proxies, including in particular Hezbollah. I mentioned that at the outset. Over the past several years, we've been working closely with our colleagues uh, at the Department of Justice in particular to raise awareness about Hezbollah's activities and to increase international cooperation, particularly on the law enforcement front in these areas. We've launched, with, together with Europol, a U.S. Europol law enforcement coordination group focusing on Hezbollah's terrorist and other illicit activities. And we've held or are holding regional sessions to coordinate efforts to counter Hezbollah's activities in places across the globe, including Eastern Europe, South America, West Africa, and Southeast Asia, all of which are areas where we believe Hezbollah has indeed a significant presence. We are also strengthening our coordination with our partners in the Persian Gulf on Hezbollah-related issues. Addressing this evolving set of terrorist threats requires an expanded approach to our counterterrorism counter engagement. President Obama has emphasized repeatedly that we need to bring strong, capable, and diverse partners to the forefront and enlist their help in the mutually important endeavor of global counterterrorism. We cannot do this alone. We will not do this alone. The attacks in Paris, in Beirut, in Mali, and elsewhere have heightened, indeed, political attention around the world and raised both the urgency and the political will to act against the evolving threat posed by ISIL, by AQ, and by the lure of violent extremism. We believe that the United States has a unique window of opportunity to press for cooperation and for reforms overseas that strengthen our collective counterterrorism efforts while preventing the further expansion of ISIL and some of these other very, very dangerous groups. This is a moment that uh, quite clearly, in my view, requires diplomatic leadership, a challenge that we in the State Department are committed to trying to take on. While we've definitely seen political will increasing around the world to take on ISIL, its branches, and its followers in the wake of the recent deadly attacks, there are many, many, many steps that our partners still need to take to address these threats successfully. And it's important to note that in addition to our diplomatic role, the State Department has significant funding that we can dedicate to improving our partners' technical capabilities. So we should be very clear that the money that the United States government spends overseas is not solely military and it is not solely to uh, you know, take on military challenges, although those are an important part and always will continue to be an important part of what we do. In addition to all the things that we're already doing, the CT Bureau, my bureau here at the State Department, currently manages, well, it currently manages about 230 million is what I would say in fiscal year 2015 foreign assistance to assist partners in building sustainable capacity to combat terrorism and address violent extremism in a rule of law framework. But in addition, in this year's fiscal year appropriation, so that's for FY16, Congress has agreed to provide the Bureau with another $175 million under the Counter Counterterrorism Partnership Fund, so-called, to expand our capacity building efforts even further. That's a significant plus up for us, $175 million against, again, a base budget of something approaching $230 million. We will focus those efforts, those additional efforts, on addressing the threat of foreign terrorist fighters, countering violent extremism, preventing and countering terrorist safe havens, and countering Iran-sponsored and linked terrorist groups, as I have described it in my remarks today. As we have reviewed, the terrorist challenges that we face continue to evolve at an incredibly rapid and very, very challenging pace. We can best protect America's interests and people over the long run by engaging in robust diplomacy, by expanding the partnerships that I've described for you that are so very, very important for our own goals, by building bilateral and regional capabilities, and by promoting holistic and rule of law based approaches to counterterrorism and to violent extremism. It's an integrated set of approaches. I think it can be effective, but it will not be an overnight effort. Um, we're going to require a lot of assistance overseas. And we're going to require a lot of understanding and assistance from our partners. 
So with that as sort of preface, I think, today, we can certainly get into any number of uh, discussions on the particulars of the things that I've mentioned. Happy to um, take up anything that you'd like. And Tom, Great. Uh, I'll let you lead Excellent. the way. Great. Okay? Thank you. Great. Thanks. You get the podium. Great. We'll do that from here, Mr. Ambassador. And we'll just take the uh, podium down. Thanks. Yeah. Folks, um, we have a big crowd today. I'll skip my question and go uh, right to the audience. Please keep it very brief. We have a very, uh, very large crowd, which we're happy to see here. And please make it a question and not a statement. Ron Marks. Yes, Dr. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we'll, we'll have a microphone. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Please Hi, Ron Marks. Please identify yourself. Yeah. I'm on the board of directors here. Um, thank you for coming. It's a good presentation. The question I have to ask you is whether within 11 months of a transition, um, assuming that you hang on, one would hope. If not, what are you saying to your successor at this point? What are the two or three items that you would say to them, you guys have got to pay attention to this. This is what's going to be carrying us forward in the future. Yeah, I, I think, can you hear me? Is that? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, I think actually if I had to highlight one thing from the remarks that I made and, and the sort of overall approach that we've discussed, it's the partnerships. Um, I, I don't think that we you know, sufficiently pay attention to the need for partners. We're always talking about what we can do. Uh, obviously, our leadership, as I highlighted in, in my discussion, is central. There's no question about it. The United States has to be there to lead. If we're not, as we've, to our dismay, found out, things tend to you know, fall apart. But that said, we cannot do it alone. There's just no way. Um, that, though, I would frame, again, not just in the context of the military efforts that we undertake, because I think all too often, and, and we do this ourselves even in government, we think about it solely in the context of um, you know, units that we train up. And that's incredibly important. We do that in a variety of places. We'll continue to do it. Um, but we also, I can tell you again from the efforts that we undertake, particularly in, in my bureau in the State Department, we have a whole array of things that we are doing with a, a number of partners from a technical standpoint. Um, but also building political will. Um, so when I talk about border management, I mean, imagine what can be more important to a country than knowing who is coming in and going out of its own borders. And yet I can tell you, because I've visited any number of these countries, so whether it's me or it's my successor, uh, there are any number of countries who just don't have that capability, do not know. Don't know who's coming, don't know who's going, don't have a database to check it against. Um, we can provide them with some of that expertise. We can even provide them with some of that information. That said, um, they're going to need to develop it on their own as well. The good news, if there is, I think is that they are um, growing in awareness of the importance of those things themselves. So if you'd asked them a year ago, two years ago, maybe not so much. Now you see that, that political will building. The question for them is, you know, and for a lot of countries, that, especially that lack resources, where do we get the resources? How do we build that capability? What can you do to assist us? And, and those are the kinds of questions that we need to answer for them. Ambassador, my colleague Jennifer Cook and I recently returned from Mali, Niger, and Nigeria, and that was one of the things they pointed out so frequently was we have huge borders. We don't have enough personnel. The borders are meaningless to people in this region, and it's a, a tremendous challenge to them. Yeah. Yes, in the front, please. Hi, Ambassador. John Hudson with Foreign Policy Magazine. Um, you drilled down a little bit on the FTF data. I was wondering if you could tell me uh, which country at this point is the greatest contributor to foreign fighters in Syria. And then the second question is, uh, how much of the $175 million, uh, that Congress appropriated is going to go towards uh, CVE programming? And uh, could you give us a little idea of what type of CVE programming uh, that will be? So um, the first question is hard to answer, and not because I'm trying to evade it, but because it depends on the metric that you use. Uh, is it just you know, per capita? Is it um, as a function of uh, you know, kind of um, increase over time? Is it that there's a variety of, of different data you can use? So rather than characterize it by a single country, I will tell you that there are countries themselves that will admit that they have a significant issue and problem, and they want to counter it, and they need our assistance, and they have asked for it. Uh, and you know you can frame a number of countries. Tunisia is one of them. 
uh, but there are many, many, many others. Um, and you know, there are these countries we really do want to help because clearly it's to their detriment and to ours if they're going to suffer from that flow of, of country or of uh, FTFs back and forth. Um, it poses a tremendous challenge to all of us. It, it poses a tremendous challenge to the country of origin, but also to the transit countries and to the you know the countries that see them moving through. So, uh, and we also worry about you know these guys coming home. Um, and uh, and by the way, when I say guys, uh, let me not let me be gender neutral here. We've seen women and men go, and which is a new phenomenon in its own way as well, which is also uh, quite troubling in its in its its uh, its parameters. Um, so it just depends on how you how you frame that. Uh, with respect to your second question, though, um, on CVE, uh, again, numbers vary depending on sort of how you count this. Let's remember that CVE has a variety of manifestations. Um, it ranges from things that are you know purely on the kind of um, counter messaging side, but it also has components that I, I framed in some of my discussion, which have to do with building relationships between community groups and, for example, law enforcement and uh, you know, uh, security sector type elements as well. So there's a huge range of things that you can class under CV. So again, it's a little bit difficult to give you a specific number. But here, let me describe for you a little bit of what is going on and what I think is so important for us. Um, the State Department, as you know, is focused externally. Uh, and we have colleagues in other agencies that focus internally. Um, the United States has a lot of good experience to share and um, has drawn on that experience from some of the things that we dealt with in the past. For example, uh, we had Somali Americans who, um, third, fourth generation, who had gone off to uh, fight in Somalia. Uh, a number of our municipalities, um, in the Midwest, Minneapolis, St. Paul, others, had had some very good experience with dealing with some of those things. Um, those kinds of things we think can be built on effectively. We'd like to see a lot more interaction between the things that we do, uh, thoughtful interaction between the things that we do from an internal perspective and an external perspective. We don't get involved in things that we do internally, but we can draw on that experience and bring it to bear on the things that we do elsewhere. Um, similarly, I think there are things we can learn from overseas that actually could be brought to bear in some of the efforts that we undertake here in the United States. Um, our colleagues in the Department of Homeland Security uh, who are now uh, putting together a new task force themselves, um, that they and other colleagues in the FBI, in the, uh, the greater law enforcement community and others um, will, be, will be putting together here, they and we, I think, are going to work much more closely together um, to try and bring those efforts in a more concentrated and a more productive fashion. So I, I see a lot of good work ahead of us um, in trying to, again, focus on those efforts, some of which will be programmatic, some of which will indeed, um, I think, you know, use some of the, the excellent money that Congress has given us. So um, we're looking forward to, you know, explaining that to our congressional stakeholders. Um, but I, again, I think that the effort here is really to just be thoughtful about how do we utilize that, that, uh, that funding and do this in a way that makes sense for us, for our partners, um, and brings the best expertise to bear. Thank you. Uh, we'll go next to the Arlie Burke Chair in Strategy at CSIS, Dr. Cordesman. Sure. Yes, sir. Ambassador, you talked about civil operations and stability operations. Let's assume that we actually do eventually liberate Mosul and Raqqa. Well, you have no stable border, one government that is largely dysfunctional, another which, in effect, doesn't exist a collapsed economy, no precedence as yet in really recovery in the cities we've occupied. How do you actually handle stability operations once you've solved the military problem with ISIS and really end up not degrading ISIS but defeating it? I think it's very challenging. I mean, you've pointed to a number of the issues that I think we're going to have to contend with. But that said, it, it, what is um, challenging makes it that much more important. Uh, I think it's very, very clear that if we don't stabilize the areas that we have liberated, um, we run the risk that, you know, again, we're going to just watch it degrade back. Um, and that does us no good. That does our partners no good. Um, I think the Iraqis have certainly accepted that premise. And I think others uh, would understand it as well. What we need are resources, first of all, to do that. 
Uh, as you know, the, the coalition partners met just this past week in Rome. Uh, there was um, also a, a lengthy discussion of um, the resources that we will bring to bear for some of the refugees. But I mean, all of the efforts of our partners need to be put against, not just, again, the military part of this, but the associated efforts um, to stabilize, to provide relief to uh, those that are suffering from the outgrowth of this. Um, and eventually, I hope, again, if we do see military victory, whether it's in Mosul or in other places, and we have seen, I mean, let's, let's be clear again, we have seen in Tikrit and other places, we've seen some, um, some really remarkable things happen, but again, that needs to be sustained. It's not as though we can just sort of let it go. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that we will be working on, we the United States, but in tandem with our partners. Um, I don't want to frame it as something that's easy to do, because uh, all these things are, are quite, quite difficult. Um, but that said, it's absolutely essential. So um, I think it will be, you will see it as a, a very large focus for our efforts over the coming months. Um, it's, it's well recognized as, as the, one of the key challenges. Eric Schmidt, please. Eric Schmidt with the New York Times. A two-part question on Libya, please, Ambassador. How immediate, and by immediate meaning in the coming weeks and months, uh, to the West and to, to Americans in particular, is the threat from the Islamic State in Libya? And, and it's kind of second to that question is Secretary Kerry, as you said, was in, has been in Rome this week talking about helping to promote the formation of a unity government there. That'll take a long time, and you still have this growing threat. How likely do you think it is that military action will have to be taken by the U.S. and its allies to help to combat that threat in the meantime? Well, I think you saw the Secretary and all of the others that were gathered in Rome uh, make the key point that, you know, what we're trying to do in Libya is, uh, is twofold, really. One is we are keeping a very weather eye on the growth of ISIL globally and then specific to Libya because we're concerned about it. I mean. ISIL in particular has a bad habit of growing in places where, um, you know, spaces are ungoverned or where they lack, uh, you know, the kind of governance that we would like to see. Um, but that said, the other part of what we're trying to do in Libya, and very, very uh, robustly actually, is support this new uh, government of national accord or the, the new arrangements that um, have been put in place and uh, to which we have lent an awful degree of, a uh, tremendous degree of, of um, of political weight and, and effort, and the secretary himself has really has has been very very active and engaged. Not to say other countries and the UN as well, because all of them have been engaged in this. Um, I think that uh, everyone that was there in Rome made it clear that those two things have to proceed together. So in other words, um, we are trying very hard to make sure that we are serving our long-term political goals, which happen to be our long-term CT goals. Uh, in, in Libya, which is to say, if you don't have a functioning government, if you don't have a prospect for um, you know, something that is going to outlast uh, the week, the month, um, then you really are, again, you're, you're just sort of um, addressing a symptom as opposed to a long-standing problem, and that's not going to help you ultimately. But that said, you pointed to a, a, an important problem as well. We don't want to see the growth of ISIL outpace uh, what otherwise will be obviously a, a you know a long-term process of trying to build out a, a successful Libyan government. So I think those two have to be balanced. I think it's important to us to achieve both objectives. Um, it will be important for us to work in tandem with all of the partners that we've already identified. Um, there's a whole range of them: uh, the Italians, other Europeans, uh, the Libyans themselves are critically important to us. Um, as well as a whole uh, variety of others who are engaged in this process. So it's a complicated uh, and very layered, um, you know, environment, and we will, we will be watching it very closely. The Secretary, I think, spoke to a lot of this just in the last day or so, so I can't really add to some of the things that he's already said. The woman in the back row, please. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I can. I'm a student at American University. My name is Maria. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I don't know if you know the extent of this, but is the U.S. doing anything to filter out maybe sympathizers or members of ISIL um, in the refugees that have flooded into Europe? Uh, um, 
Look, I think we've seen that, um, you know, over time there are things that we, you know, we do need to watch for. I would say not so much we, the United States, even so much as our partners in Europe need to be vigilant about and concerned about. I wouldn't overcharacterize that, though. I, you know, I really want to um, highlight the fact that, you know, those that are coming out of uh, Syria and Iraq need to be thought of as a, a migrant class that are, um, you know, really deserving of our attention because of all the things, the bad things that are going on in Syria and Iraq. So let's, let's not lose sight of that. Um, the security component is there. We need to be thoughtful about it. Um, I think there are things that we can do. We've talked to our European colleagues about some of the basic bottom line preventive measures that probably could be enacted that they could uh, think about doing in, you know, with regard to that. But again, you know, we're going to have to balance all of these competing elements. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to portray the, the, you know, the vast majority of these people that are coming out of Syria and Iraq as security threats to us, because I think that would be the wrong way of looking at this. Um, I think that we really do, um, we need to take care of those issues that concern us from a security vantage point, and we have ways of doing some of that, uh, and we, the United States, have ways of doing some of that as well. Um, but I don't want to, you know, again, I, I think we have to be a little careful about how we frame some of those elements and how we talk about it. So. Great. Thanks. Christian Beckner. Thanks. Christian Beckner with the GW Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. Ambassador, you referenced uh, information sharing agreements with 49 countries. How satisfied are you with the current state of implementation of those agreements in terms of the scope of information that's being shared, how quickly it's being shared by foreign partners, and, and does the recent uh, legislation to update the visa waiver program language give you additional leverage to encourage our allies to improve the, uh, the type of information that they're sharing? Um, well, as with anything, I mean, some I think we would characterize as really, you know, very, very free-flowing, others perhaps a little less so. You know, not everyone is going to be the exact same measure in terms of what we get or what we don't get. What I do want to highlight, though, is, um, and I need to be clear about this, um, there is a difference between sharing information in a border and law enforcement sense and, uh, and sharing it in an intelligence sense. Oftentimes, we have an excellent relationship with a country in terms of intelligence sharing. No problems, no issues, free-flowing information, because intelligence, by its very nature, actually, oddly enough, because, you know, it, it's not in the public realm, it flows and it's, you know, quite, quite, um, we have a long practice in terms of sharing with some of our best partners. That's not a problem. Um, it's a little harder sometimes even in the law enforcement and border arena. Why? Because, you know, this is stuff that um, some countries are used to sharing and some are less used to sharing. Some have concerns about data privacy that are germane. We understand them. Um, but on the other hand, again, we think they have to be balanced off against the greater security for, you know, the larger, the larger population. Um, these are the kinds of things we're going to continue to discuss with our partners. Um, and I think we will find that modus of Vivendi with a number of them. In fact, we already have. Uh, and it's, it's really, I think, again, it, from their point of view, it's, it's a growing degree of awareness. Truly, because um, again, where they might have been a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, in an environment after Paris, in an environment after two actually major attacks in Paris, in Copenhagen, in other places, um, I think even you know they are beginning to understand that those trade-offs are trade-offs. Um, so we will have to see kind of where this goes. But I do think that the political will is growing, and we will um, do everything we can. And we, as I said, we've offered them expertise um, in a number of different realms, not just in information sharing, but in a whole variety of things where we happen to have, I'm sorry to say to, um, to our great, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't want it this way necessarily, but that's what we have. We have that kind of expertise in a number of these things. We don't want to be overbearing about it because these are countries with longstanding practice, a number of them. But on the other hand, we have it to share if they, if they wish it. So um, we have, we do have some things that we can offer them. Great. The woman next to Christian, please. Hi, Allison for Sperley National Defense Magazine. So you touched upon um, ISIL's use of social media platforms to sort of spread its message. Can you elaborate on specific steps you're taking to address that and 
maybe prevent the further recruitment of sort of these younger, more impressionable um, people. Uh, and then also, I think I heard you say the government might, might not be the proper person to maybe even combat this message, so who would that fall to? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, just to restate what I said in my remarks, it's, it's really difficult to see, I mean, you know, we, we, we've tried to go at this in a different number of ways over time. And, and you know, it's a new phenomenon, to be honest with you. So I think it's, it's legitimate to try different things and then see what works, what doesn't work so well. Um, and I think we have found, uh, not entirely surprisingly probably, that again, governments are not always best placed to do this. Because, you know, the question is, what's a credible voice? And in an environment internationally where, you know, they're using the, the notion that both governments are illegitimate, um, specific governments are illegitimate, Western governments are illegitimate, then, you know, I mean, again, how credible can you be? It's very difficult to say. Um, and, you know, what's the counter message? So, in other words, crafting that is quite a sophisticated bit of business. I mean, you have to be um, very, very nuanced, very thoughtful, and, and you've got to do that on a time frame that is also quite, um, you know, quite, uh, uh, you know, adaptive. And that's not something we're always particularly good at. Um, that said, it's clearly more important over time. So, as I said previously, the things that are the most challenging are often the things that are the most difficult. Um, I think that the, the effort now has been, and it's, it's the right direction if you ask me, of course, um, but uh, it's to get away from this notion of direct messaging from, let's say, the U.S. government, or even from other governments, um, whether they're Muslim or they're any other government. I don't think governments are necessarily the best voices for this. Um, and even finding, um, you know, voices within the larger communities is quite challenging in and of itself. So it's not so much the case necessarily that um, you might find y y there may be a whole variety of these, these voices that you're looking for. But I find and I think that uh, the, the best work you do is actually very, very, very um, micro. It's getting down into the specific communities. Um, and again, that's going to depend on the environment in which you find yourself. Uh, it may vary very much between South Asia, right, and or some part of South Asia or Southeast Asia uh, and some other part of the world that, you know, again, has a dramatically different context. You have to assist those community elements that are looking for those ways, again, to reach into those communities and stop that kind of recruitment or intervene early in that cycle and aid them and assist them. So if we can't do the work, we're, we're, what we're looking for is the partner that can do the work and hopefully find that partner and give them the, the tools, the funding, the kinds of things that we're going to need to do. Now that's not, again, an overnight prospect and it's not easy. Um, so I don't want to frame for you that this is something that you know, we're going to be able to accomplish in a minute, but I think it's absolutely critical. It's a new model. It's something that we will have to take on over time. Um, it is something that, again, I don't think governments, certainly not at a, at a national level, um, are, are particularly the right agents of doing. But that said, they need to support it. In other words, I, you know, I think it's critical that um, governments are interactive with their NGOs, that they don't sort of X out NGOs in the interest of security and say, oh, we're not interested in you know, having relationships with those organizations, no, no. No, quite the opposite. They need those organizations. They're going to need them. We are going to need those, those forms of assistance because otherwise you're not going to be effective at all. Um, but it's, it's very, very, very difficult work and it's challenging and it's going to take time. Woman in the red scarf, please. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Marsha Wong with ICRC, and oh, thank hi, you. It's good to see you, Tina. Yeah. Hey. And thank you for this very candid conversation today, and I appreciate CSIS and sure. hosting this. Um, maybe to piggyback on your last comment, Tina, about um, the inclusion of NGOs. As you can imagine, ICRC is going to work in some of these some of these dark places. As you build your partnership capacity, in many of these countries have these issues because of inherent um, problems within governance, within that rule of law framework. How are you managing that delicate conversation with them on the need for security, but not at the expense of fundamental democratic rule of law rights and principles? I think that's critical. It's so totally critical. And it's, it's really hard to do with some countries, I, I will admit to you. I think some countries have taken 
um, I won't say exclusively, but a much more sort of focused security-based approach to counterterrorism. It's completely understandable in the context of, you know, the threats that they face, but it's the wrong approach in our view because to so do is to perpetuate the cycle of problems that they, you know, end up finding because the sense of injustice grows. Um, you know, over time you get the, the, you know, the same problems that really kind of led to some of your basic bottom line, um, you know, sense of, of alienation and other kinds of things that, uh, that we know can be problematic. So I think the, and, and frankly, I, just from any vantage point, the rule of law has to be the basis of what you do, whether it's prosecutions or whether it's, uh, you know, um, building legislation that will adequately protect you against um, terrorist threats. It's got to be rule of law based. There, there's no other way. So I think we have a very robust conversation we have to have with a number of countries. That's going to be ongoing. Um, some have been, again, more responsive, some less so. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're going to stop trying. Um, and I think ultimately they will find that, again, it is in their interest to so do. Now, how long it takes them to come to that realization, I can't answer all the time. But, um, but it will be really, really critical that we not give up that, that effort. Yeah. So. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Hi, Faika Mahmood from the Stimson Center. Mm -hmm. um, related to the point of partnerships, I was wondering what, what role do you envision for Muslim communities in Western countries, specifically in, in the United States? What, what does that engagement look like for, from your perspective? It, it's a huge array of things. I mean, you know, it's all the things that I frame today and, and more. Um, I mean, the partnership elements that I talk about involve all sorts of things. Everything ranging, and now I'm just talking about the civilian, okay, so leave aside even the military. But um, as I said, building information sharing uh, arrangements that we have because we want them to know what's headed in their direction. We want to know what they think is, you know, important from their vantage point. It's border management and border security, which oftentimes, again, they lack and they lack resources. It's CVE oriented because in many instances, their community groups, again, lack the, either the resources or the ability to do the kind of work. They're not used to it necessarily, um, or they just don't have, again, the, the reach or the, the, the funding to do it, and we can provide some of that. Um, it is, you know, there's a huge array of things that we can be doing in these countries. Uh, and it depends on the country, and it depends on the background of, you know, where we've found things to be the most productive. And sometimes, you know, it depends on also the willingness of the country to pursue those efforts. So it has to be based on political will. We can't force a country to necessarily undertake those efforts. Um, but I do see, as I said, more willingness these days to, to really consider this stuff and to, to, to do it um, with a greater degree of interest and investment than I did certainly even when I started this job, which is, you know, maybe 18 months ago, two years ago. So, I, and I think that's, a, that's actually a real change, so. Great, this gentleman here. Hello, my name is Patrick Jamison. I'm with a cyber threat intelligence company, a WAPAC Labs. And one of our analysts uh, a week ago came across 16,000 ISIL email accounts. How can we click quickly uh, with the Global Engagement Center? How can we quickly get this information to the government that's actionable from a private source and get this uh, worked on? Um, well, I'm happy to put you in touch with folks at the State Department who are you know, responsible for that particular aspect of what we're doing. Probably better not here to, to do that, but you know, we have POCs and that's the kind of thing that you can discuss with them. Sure. Thanks. Great. Woman in the middle, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, Linda Nemec with the Novanti Group. Our research shows that um, ISIS has been fairly effective in providing services where they have um, provided governance. And we wanted to ask, what kind of counter can there be to that after ISIS leaves in terms of supporting governance entities when there's no real national unity, unity government in Libya or wherever, but no national government entity that can be relied upon? Yeah, that's a good question, and, and it's interesting. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on sort of how you characterize it. Yes, they provided services, but it's in the absence of anything else, and of course it's also in the, you know, through all sorts of manipulation as well as, uh, you know, threats and God knows what all else. So, and we've seen some of the excellent reporting done by the New York Times and by the Washington Post on sort of how the, 
um, some of this proceeds. But, um, but that said, and I, I didn't really get a chance to talk about our counterfinance efforts. Uh, that's another thing we do with our partners, by the way, is, is um, think about counterfinance of, of terrorism. Um, I do think that's an important aspect of, of it's, it's in part hinged to the stability operations stuff. Um, you know, liberated areas need to be thought, we have to think through what's the, the methodology of governance. Um, because if there is none, then again, you're just sort of headed back towards a situation of lawlessness. Um, but on the other hand, it's also a function of trying to undermine the, their ability to do business as usual um, in places where they're clearly drawing some sort of either income or um, you know, other source of, of resources. Um, and we've had some success in that, oddly enough. It's a little more challenging in the case of ISIL than in other groups because ISIL does not, uh, unlike Al-Qaeda and sort of the past model, um, they weren't drawing quite so much on outside contributions. They have a variety of sources that come you know, locally from uh, whether it's basically extortion of you know, the local, uh, both taxpayer, if you want to call it that, um, or uh, from small-scale oil um, supplies or from, and, and we've upped the quotient of directed attacks against um, some of their oil infrastructure. Uh, we've been able to identify some other elements of their, so I think that's actually an important part of what we, we do need to do in order to disrupt them on the ground. Um, and we are, we're ramping up the, the efforts on that as well. But, but you're quite right on the stability ops uh, piece of that in the future. I think it's, it's a, a real factor of what we have to think about as we um, you know, move forward in trying to reclaim territory that was once lost to, uh, to ISIL. Over on the left, please. Um, hi, my name is Sean Harris. I work for Conflict Armament Research. I had a question about border control uh, with the partners um, against ISIL, mm -hmm. um, not just Turkey, but also in Europe. Uh, you're talking about regulating and controlling uh, people moving through those borders. Uh, what are your, is sort of the emphasis on precursor chemicals and uh, components for IEDs, uh, which has been a, a main weapon used by ISIS, actually, more so than the Kalashnikov? Um, well, I, I wouldn't speak about that specifically in the European sense. Um, I think, generally speaking, uh, IEDs are a growing concern for us, and that's globally, by the way. That's not in a European context, that's across the board. I've started a number of conversations with a whole series of countries, actually, uh, with respect to um, counter IED efforts. Uh, we, our DOD colleagues, others are very engaged in this, because Again, unfortunately, we have quite a bit of experience with respect to um, Afghanistan, other place where we've, you know, to our great regret, uh, you know, undergone a lot of, of bad experience with this. Countries are finding more and more, as you've said, that, um, you know, this is a threat to them. Uh, and I think it's a good way of starting a CT conversation with countries that otherwise may have, we may not have full, you know, kind of, we may not see eye to eye on everything, but that's certainly a, a, you know, an array of things that we can try and work on together because you know, undisputedly, that's the thing that we're both concerned about. So, so there are a variety of countries where actually that's a good, useful starting point. It's not the be all and end all, but it's certainly something that we care about. Um, and again, I wouldn't frame it in any one geographic context. I think it's, it's unfortunately, again, global. So. All the way in the back, please. Hi, Alex Sanchez, I write now and then for James Defense Weekly. My, my question is about counter-messaging again. Does your department have a lot of uh, interaction with agencies that deal with public diplomacy, like Post of America, like the International Information Aid Program, or as the State Department? Do you, deal with, do you have a lot of interaction with these agencies to try to create a message to counter ISIS message? Thank well, you. again, I, I think I tried to describe, um, I mean, you know, we had, uh, we had an entity called the um, CSCC, everything has an acronym, as I said, uh, um, um, the Center for Strategic uh, Counterterrorism Communications, um, which has now um, sort of morphed into something a little bit different. The, the initial effort was to try and do this sort of direct messaging that I think you're referencing. It, it, it has its problems, and the problems are as we've identified them. So without going through that again, um, I think the, the difficulty is, you know, again, governments and certainly the U.S. government may not be the best messenger for all of that. So the question is, what is the best approach or what is an alternative approach? 
our hope is that by taking the CSCC, by changing it into something a little different, um, this Global Engagement Center, which has more of a empowering effort. In other words, what it will do is it will try to give those partners overseas those alternative voices that we think can be credible, some of which, as I said, will be very micro, some of which will maybe be a little less so, um, but give them some um, wherewithal, some assistance, some technical advice uh, to, to try and you know, make sure that they are getting what they need. So that's the effort. It, this is nascent. So you know, how it's going to work out, I'm not exactly, uh, I couldn't tell you at this moment. But I think that's the, that's the thinking that underpins that. And again, that in tandem with what we're doing from an internal USG point of view, that can be very powerful if indeed we bring it together in a way that draws on the experience of both. So that's the thinking. Great. One more question. I think Bob Stillman in the back, please. Mm -hmm. you want to, you, uh, uh, what would be your response to those voices who are uh, continually saying that there is no way you can affect any of these very productive policies without a substantial increase in military involvement and specifically boots on the ground? Well, again, that's not really, that's not so much my, um, mine to answer and certainly not mine alone. Um, but I will say this, I, I think that um, we are pursuing a course that um, demonstrably over time will have impact, um, has had impact. Uh, you can chart some of that impact. I think we've discussed today some of the things that we really have seen as a positive. I don't ever want to overcharacterize because there's so much left to do. Um, and because those challenges are very real, the ones that we've, we've discussed. Um, I think that there are things that can be done through military means, and there are things that we'll never be able to accomplish, as I said, solely through military means. Um, and we have to be very clear about that latter bit, um, because to say that we are able to do everything via you know, um, a military approach is just, I think, to fool ourselves. Uh, that's not to say that, the, again, the military doesn't have a role to play in certain very important things. In Iraq and in Syria, with respect to ISIL, it's clear. Um, but then again, we have partners on the ground that are accomplishing important things uh, you know, that, that we cannot do, um, whether it's the Iraqis themselves, whether it's the Kurds, whether it's the Syrian Arabs, whether it's the, I mean, we need those partners. We absolutely must have those partners. Uh, that's true in Libya, that's true elsewhere, uh, and, and not just in Syria and Iraq. So, you know, again, it's a complicated answer. I, you know, I don't pretend to have all the answers for you sitting here, but I, I really truly believe that the efforts that we are pursuing are having a measured, measured measurable difference. Um, and uh, that I will tell you because I've sit, I sit here every day and I pursue it. If I didn't think there was a point in it, I wouldn't be doing it. So. Thank you very much. Before I thank the ambassador, just let me uh, make an announcement that on March 4, we will host Dr. Greg Treverton. He's the chairman of the National Intelligence Council, and we hope to see you all then at this point. Um, Ambassador, you have one of the toughest jobs in government. There's no doubt about it. These are incredible challenges. Social media has compounded it to such an incredible degree, and we have foreign fighters from over 100 countries. Operating and working with these partners is very difficult. We have a lot of complex friends, partners, allies, and we're glad that you're leading the effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate it. That was great. Thank Fantastic. You. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thanks again for coming and for sitting through it. I appreciate it.